Hello, my name is Graham Golden. I've, I've already spoken to you as part of this MVP virtual summit when I talked about thinking differently in my keynote speech that you will have watched before watching this, this session. I've been asked by the conference organizers to take you through one of the key activities within MVP, the leadership and bystander activity. I'll share some slides shortly, but you know, MVP at its heart is a leadership program. And you'll learn in this session why that is, what, why MVP is rooted in your leadership, personal leadership, individual leadership, and how leadership can help prevent, not just for the short term, but for the long term, instances of abuse and violence in, in um, today's society. So let me share my screen with you, and I'm gonna take you through this session. And this is an activity that I really enjoy delivering to, to young people and adults. I deliver this in many different settings. I deliver this activity when I'm working in prison settings, when I'm working in sports teams, when I'm working in offices and workspaces, universities, and indeed schools. And um, this quote that, um, I have um, put at the very start of this presentation, really emphasizes and bring home the leadership element of the MVP program. Um, I think it's important that we, we start with this. The standard you walk past is the standard you accept. That was a quote by Lieutenant General David Morrison back in 2013, when something was something wrong, something harmful, abusive was taking place in his organization, i.e. the Australian military, the army, and he went on record and gave a great three minute um, talk, delivered to his whole organization, but latterly to the whole of the uh, Australian population. And within this, he said this quote, the standards you walk past is the standards you accept. And for me and for all those involved in MVP, this articulates, communicates what MVP is trying to really achieve. It's to say that if you see something that is wrong, if you walk past it, what are you saying to the individuals involved? For me, silence is the infection that keeps violence going. You know, our silence says to victims of abuse that we don't care about you. You have done something wrong. And I think silence says to the, the some that perpetrate abuse, that commit abuse and violence in society, that what they're doing is okay. So we need to really own our silence and really understand where silence is leading to if we don't step into um, the situation. So my aims today are to look at this word leadership. Let's define it. Let's make the link between leadership and the prevention of abuse and violence in society. Then we're going to start to combine this with this term, the bystander, and we'll define the term bystander within the MVP program. We'll discuss reasons why people don't get involved in situations, why people don't step up and do something. And we'll then describe a bystander toolkit. By the end of this session, I'm going to give you a set of tools, a set of ways that you can be proactive. You can be active bystanders. You know, very quickly, we talk about the term bystander. What often comes to mind? It's often passive, people being passive, walking and doing, you know, seeing something and not doing anything. And this session will bring the bystander front and center into the conversation, but importantly, give the bystander, i.e., you, some tools and strategies to be active, to, to be able to do something when you see something that's abusive, harmful, not right taking place. So that's, these are some of the aims that we're gonna talk about in, in today's session. And for me, these aims, these toolkits, it's to allow us all just to be more active in our communities. No more bystanding, no more standing by, you know, owning our silence and knowing what our silence communicates, but also knowing what we can do when we're faced with a troubling, problematic situation. You know, leadership means many different things to many different people. And I want all of you to start thinking about what makes a good leader. I've just listed some of, of the traits that I think are important. I think there's many more. I'm going to talk about them shortly. And I think a good way for us to talk about these, these issues is I'm going to ask you a question and I'm going to give you 20 seconds to think about it in your head or speak to the person next to you. There'll be a countdown clock coming up on the screen. But I want you to think about who you most admire and why. Who are the, you've got 15 seconds left, very quick. Who are the people in society that you really look to? It could be a teacher, it could be your parents, it could be a carer, it could be a coach. 
Who are they and why do you admire that individual? Nearly there, two seconds, one second. Okay, and I think when we start to look at the leaders in this world, let's start to look at our own leaders, people who've inspired us. You know, as a former police officer, I've worked with the best and the worst in leaders. My last um, leader that I worked under within the, within the police service, um, it was a detective chief superintendent, John Carnahan, head of the violence reduction unit, and he gave me space. He was courageous, he was innovative, he had vision, but he gave me, he trusted me. He gave me space. So I think we all need to start to look at leaders who have inspired you and some people who've inspired me over the years, you know, Oprah Winfrey. Um, I just think that she is a very caring, compassionate individual. I remember watching the, the Netflix documentary about the, the Central Park Five and she was interviewing these young men who'd spent a lot of their lives wrongly convicted of a murder, a homicide. And she was, you know, during the interview, she was so aware of what these young men had gone through. And she gave them time, she gave them space to talk about it. You know, I think she just left her presence as caring, as compassionate. And I value that in a leader. And David Morrison, Lieutenant David Morrison, General David Morrison, the standard you walk past is the standard you accept. He was top of the Australian military back in 2013 and had to act. He had to be a leader. He is a leader, but he really had to be a leader. And he was a guy, he's a guy who articulates his values. For me, it's about ethical leadership. He, his decisions are made based on who he is as an individual. And that shines through in that, in that speech that he made to his organizations. So there's two leaders in real life that have inspired me. And I'll give you a one from from the you know from the sort of um fiction side of things dorothy from the wizard of oz and the reason why i see her as a fantastic leader and a coach is because she it's her ability to, to to believe in individuals you know we talk about the lion remember the lion in the wizard of oz seeking courage he always had it was always there and what dorothy did was she brought it out of the lion so when it had to when he had to show courage the line did show courage. It was always there. He didn't need that, that medal that says that you now have courage. It was always there. And I think a leader is somebody who believes in other individuals and is able to bring out the best in that individual. And there's three people, including Dorothy, who I, who've inspired me as, as, as leaders in this world. And I think for me, these are some of the, the key traits of leadership, selflessness, thinking of other people. At this time of COVID, we need to be thinking of each other, not ourselves. Not, sorry, not just ourselves. Public health is about thinking of how my actions impact on other individuals. So selflessness is so, so important for me. Compassion and empathy. The answer to every challenge we have in society is what are we doing about improving relationships? And at the heart of improving relationships is compassion and empathy. That ability to put yourself in that person's shoes, even for that instant to try and understand what that person's going through. A determination, a, d a drive, a vision. And you know, I, I see that, in, I saw that in my leader in the police service, John Carnock, and a determination to reduce violence in Scotland. You know, Scotland went from one of the most violent countries in Europe to one of the countries leading the way in the world and how we tackle violence in, so in society. And that came from a vision, from determination by John, who then inspired people around, including me, to be the leader. And the last one is courage. You know, in my keynote, I talked about thinking differently. You know, as a former police officer, I often get told that I was a soft cop because I cared about individuals. And sometimes to, to, to speak up and talk about a person's trauma or what's happened to them in the past, I'm, I'm going against the grain. I'm going against what other people are thinking. And, you know, my view is that good ideas are the ones that scare the hell out of people. Um, and that takes guts, it takes courage. So these are some of the key aims for me. And that last one, role model. Uh, you know, what, what you promote, you permit. You know, as a man, I, I'm very keenly about talking about issues of violence and abuse, about men's role and not just the commission, but the prevention of violence as well. I quite talk openly about mental health. You know, I talk about my own mental health. I talk about vulnerability because what I promote, I can permit. So you are all going to be leaders in your school communities. You're going to be role modeling positive behaviors in your school. So you're leaders. It's going to take guts sometimes, some courage, determination, thinking of other people and understanding other people. But you are role models 
in, in society. You know, so you know, what's the connection? His 20, 20 second, the clock's on again. What's the connection between leadership and the prevention of violence and abuse? Let's think about that. What's the connection between leadership, the traits I've talked about, courage, determination, care, empathy, understanding. What's the connection between that and the prevention of violence and abuse in society? Because I look at violence prevention through a lens of leadership. You know, we need, you know, violence is a wicked problem. And what I mean by a wicked problem is that there's no exact way to deal with it. You know, when you deal with it one way, it'll change shape and you'll have to deal with it another way as well. Violence needs lots of different fronts. And leadership is one front. Leadership from, not just from organizations, at a political, a macro level, a political level, a societal level, um, or, you know, because when it comes to violence and abuse, we're all leaders. And I want you all to start thinking about that. You are leaders in your community, and it's important that you start to understand that. So, the, you know, for me, the connection is knowledge. You know, good leaders have knowledge. And when you have knowledge around violence and abuse, you, you then know how to spot the signs. So we should all do the knowledge when it comes to um, violence and abuse. You, as part of your training, will learn more about types of abuse, what's going on in society around bullying, around domestic violence, sexual violence, and other forms of violence and abuse. Have the knowledge, you can then talk about it to other individuals, and you can be the role models, but you can also learn to spot it in your friends, your family, and your sports teams, or whatever. Selflessness, thinking of other people. You, how your behaviors impact on other people's behavior. Compassion and empathy. You know, you know, being a leader um, sometimes requires you to listen with compassion and empathy to people in your social circle or if you're a leader in the workspace. Someone might tell you they've been a victim of domestic abuse or sexual abuse. That might happen at university and school. Someone discloses. Your job isn't to fix that person's problem. Your job is to listen. Listen to prevent. Listen and understand. Determination. You know, we can make a difference. Individuals, by speaking up, by stepping up, can make a difference. That requires determination and an understanding. Using the knowledge that you've got, you know, my view is that violence is totally preventable. It's not inevitable. I've learned that from the best, from the, from the academics, from the practitioners, from people with lived experience. They've taught me so much. I'm determined because I know we can make a difference. I've seen MVP work it can make a massive, massive difference. So I'm determined to give you the best start in this program. And lastly, courage. You know, we're gonna talk about bystanders shortly. You, we, we, we're gonna be talking about you as a bystander, seeing something and doing something. Not stepping back or walking away, but stepping in. That's gonna take guts because other people are often doing nothing. And they're often waiting for one person, the power of one, I call it, one person to step up. That takes guts to get, put yourself outside of the group right smack in the middle of that spotlight. That takes guts and it takes courage. So that's, that's the connection. With more knowledge, you can spot the signs, you can respond. With selflessness you, and compassion and empathy, you start to understand a victim's experience, that they're not to blame for what's happened to them. Determination, we can make a difference in our school communities. You know what, it's gonna to be tough, it's gonna to be hard, it's gonna take courage and guts. So these are all the connections that we make in MVP between the prevention of abuse and leadership, something we think about. So let's talk about bystanders. You know, there's a, <coughs> a typical bystander um, picture that I use in my training. A person lying on the ground, he doesn't need help, um, he'll be okay, you know, someone else will handle it, I guess he's drunk. You know, that is the, the bystander effect in action. You know, why are people not stepping up? Why are people, for this moment, deciding not to act? Think about it, think in yourself for a few seconds. I've no countdown clock on this slide. Think about why people are not stepping up. The clues are often in the comments above the people's heads. First one for me is someone else, people are thinking somebody else is gonna deal with it. The bystander effect. The science says that the more people that see something, the less likely people will step up. But the science also says that when one person steps up, other people follow. Other reasons why we don't get involved, we're scared. Every action will have a consequence. If I step forward, could I become a victim? Making judgments, not getting involved in other people's business. And the big one for me is, I don't know what to do. I want to help, I see a problem, but I don't know what to do. 
When I joined the police service, I was given tools. I was given handcuffs, a baton, I was given a radio, I was given powers of arrest, powers of search. I was given ways to respond to a situation that I came across in my work. I think a lot of, and I know a lot of people like yourself, you see situations, but you don't know how to respond. Because I think bystanders often think there's only one way to respond, and that's to step in. And that brings dangers. Okay, so I think we need to, for, for you to help people move from the passive to the active, we need to understand why people don't get involved. And that's a key question that you will ask in all your MVP scenarios. Why are people not getting involved in this situation? Talk about these fears. Don't discount these fears. Don't, don't push them to the side because these are real fears that young people have and adults have when they see something happening. So we really need to understand. Notice the term the bystander. How would you defer, define this definition? How would you define the term bystander? Think about it. When we use that phrase bystander, what are you thinking about? You know, for me, most people think about a person standing by, watching, usually doing nothing. In an MVP context, it covers all of that. It covers, but we, we tend to focus more on friendships, classmates, teammates, people seeing something actually happening. People seeing the build up to something actually happening. You know, it could be name calling, it could be isolation, rumors, things that are going on. But it could also be afterwards as well, before, during, and after. And by after, I mean someone might disclose that something's happened to them. I have been a victim of bullying. I have been a victim of domestic abuse. Can you help me? So we are all bystanders before, during, and after. And MVP, we don't tend to focus on the stranger situation. We focus on that circle of friends. And whilst if I, if I see something happening with a stranger situation, I have a physical fear to get involved. I, if I step in, I might be, become a victim, physically attacked. But within a friendship circle, I don't fear my best friend punching me in the face, but I do fear being isolated from the group. So I think even though we're looking at friendships, it, that presents big challenges still for us as, as, as bystanders. And that, that notion, do bystanders have the power? Damn right they do. They have the power to make things worse by not doing anything. Let's not forget that. But as a police officer, I would often interview witnesses who said to me, Graham, I knew something was going to happen. I could tell this wasn't going to end well. And I used to get frustrated when I, when I wrote these statements down in my police notebook because I thought to myself, why didn't you do something? And I think in the right situation, with the right knowledge, with the right tools, with the courage, you all have the ability to move from the passive to the active. So bystanders can escalate by doing nothing or watching or filming and saying, you know, fight, 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 as we often see in playgrounds and around the world. But you can also step in before you see something, you see a build up to a fight or a situation, take your friend away. And we'll talk about tools shortly. So you have the power to prevent and de-escalate a situation as well. I want to do a, a very quick activity with you just now. Um, this is a classic MVP activity, close your eyes. And you know, just now you're in your classrooms or wherever you are, and I'm, I'm in Scotland, many thousands of miles away, and I want you to close your eyes or put your head down. Close your eyes, put your head down. And we'll do a visualization activity just now. And before I, before I go through it, I'm gonna ask you to think about a person you care about who is being a victim of abuse. That's what I'm gonna talk about. So let's close our eyes or put our heads down. Okay, I want you to imagine your best friend, a person you care about. It could be a member of your family, it could be a member of your sports team, it could be the person, the person sitting next to you, somebody that you really, really care about. I want you to imagine that that person is on a street somewhere, in a room, and somebody is verbally or physically abusing them. And I want you to imagine there's a third person in this scenario, there's a bystander present. And bear in mind, you're not there. I want you to imagine there's a bystander present in this scenario. And the bystander sees what's happening, is in a position to do something, but they just walk away, leaving that person that you really care about on their own. Okay, open your eyes, put your head up. So first question I'm gonna ask all of you is, how did it feel? How did it feel 
to imagine that. When I do this activity, I have you know, people say to me, I am really angry. I'm really angry. And we'll come back to that shortly. I feel um, helpless. I wasn't there. I wanted to help, but I wasn't there. I couldn't do anything. People feel quite emotional. A whole number of feelings. And some of the feelings that I've talked about, you will have had that, and there'll be other feelings as well. Going back to anger, when I asked people who were you angry at, people will more often than not say the bystander. Despite there being a perpetrator of abuse, they will focus the anger on the bystander. And I say, why are we angry at the bystander? Um, well, they did nothing. So we're going to use some words to describe the bystander. And they'll use words like cowardly, um, scared. No, they'll use words like you know, coward, um, stupid. And then somebody will say scared. So we've gone from cowardly to scared. And I asked the question, why do you think the bystander chose to do nothing? And all the things we've just discussed in that image I showed you, scared, don't know what to do, don't want to become a victim. It's not my responsibility. They all come out in the discussion. So people are angry at the bystander, but some people are empathizing with the bystander, understanding it's difficult. We've no idea. We weren't there. We don't know what was going through that person's head. Have they been involved in something before where they became a victim? Past experience has stopped them from being the active, the active participant. So the impact, what's the impact on your loved one, the person you care about? Is it short term? Is it a long term? Short term, could it be um, the injuries that could heal? Long term, could it be emotional trauma, it's fear, fear going out, not trusting people? Something's going to happen to them. Do they, do, they, do they internalize it? Do they blame themselves for what happened to them? We know that victims blame themselves for what happens, and then we blame them as well. These are all issues. Could this lead to poor mental health? Could this lead to drug addiction, alcohol addiction, self-harm? Suicide. We know that lots of victims of abuse can take their own life and do take their own life in far too many numbers. So these are all issues that are at play in this, in this scenario. I want, I want you to do something. Raise your hands and look around the room here. Raise your hands if you think the bystander could have done something. Could have done something. Let's not talk about what they could have done, but could they have done something to have stopped that? I'm putting my hand up. And I know that you, most of you in the room, if not all of you, will be putting your hands up as well. Look around the room. We all agree that the bystander has the power to do something. So what could the bystander have done? Think about what could the bystander have done? And I'm going to show you very shortly a toolkit that I give to young people and adults and all the different settings that I work. Because I'm quite sure that Bystanders, you, you'll be saying things, they could have shouted something, they could have phoned the police, they could have phoned, they could have told somebody else, they could have engaged people around them, other people walking by, can you help me out here? Remember the bystander effect. The likelihood is that other people will have seen this as well, but you're all waiting for that one person to step up. I want you to be that one person who learns to overcome the bystander effect and activates other bystanders, other people who've seen something. This toolkit that you're going to talk a lot about in your <coughs> MVP work, we talk about direct intervention, stepping in. And bear in mind, every action will have a consequence. And this toolkit starts, for always starts from a place of selfishness. And what I mean by that is your primary responsibility to in any situation is to yourself. I always say to people before you use this toolkit, you always say in your head, right, am I safe? And I think if you do that, even for that first second, that first two seconds, you are thinking of yourself and then you can start to decide, like, what can I do? So direct, stepping in. What's the, most, you know, what's the most powerful thing that you can say to a friend who's a victim of abuse, a victim of bullying or domestic abuse? For me, it's, it's not your fault. Get that out. If you think of, you know, and a direct intervention doesn't have to involve speaking to the bully or speaking to the abuser, you could be speaking to the victim. And if that's your decision to speak to the, the, the victim on this occasion, get that out in the first few seconds. Hey, I saw what happened to you. That wasn't your fault. Or if a person tells you, a friend tells you something's happened to them, thank them for telling you. Thank you for telling me that must have been difficult. You didn't deserve that. Direct intervention could also mean speaking to the problem. The friend who, that's going to take a lot of courage, a lot of guts. 
but your friend could become, could get kicked out of school, could get kicked off the sports team, could get in trouble with the police. How about connecting before we correct them? And what I, use, what I mean by that is connect before correct. What I mean by that is, hey, I'm your friend. I've known you through high school. I've known you X number of years, whatever. You're my best friend. I care about you. I don't want you losing, you know, getting kicked out of school. That's the connection. But hey, what I saw last night or just then was wrong. That's not you. What's going on? That, that was wrong. That's the correction. Connect before correct. Don't be too quick to call people out and public, publicly humiliate people. I think sometimes some people do things not realizing what they're doing is wrong. So, and I think if you fight them and, and shout at them and say, stop doing that, that is wrong, um, in, in that type of way, you run the risk of losing friendships. So connect before correct. Indirect, distraction, disruption. Change the subject, take your friend away and practice these, these dis distractions, disruptions. You know, how can you just change the subject? Tell a joke, just take your friend to the toilet, take your friend away from the, from the situation. But bear in mind, you might not have dealt with, that, dealt with what's going on. It might happen again the next day or the next week. So you might have to circle back the next day and have that courageous conversation, either as to the victim or to the perpetrator. That wasn't your fault, or connect before correct. Circle back. Engage allies. The social science around situations suggests that if you've seen a problem, other people have seen a problem as well. So speak to friends. Engage other people in your circle of friends. Defer to others. So if you don't feel you can deal with something yourself, Tell a teacher, tell a parent, tell a coach. Phone the police if you're out, out in, in, in a situation. Defer to somebody else who's more qualified and more experienced. You're still doing something. Don't forget that, you're still doing something. And the after the fact, the next day, maybe in, a, in conjunction with a distraction, disruption, you circle back. But maybe you just don't feel you have allies at the time. There's no one else to speak to. You don't have a distraction. You know, as long as you come back the next day and have that chat with the, the victim, that can be very empowering for a victim. I saw what happened to you, that wasn't your fault. That's very, you know, victims blame themselves and our job is to remove blame from that, from, that, from that individual. That toolkit is there and you will use a lot of that toolkit when you do more sessions with, within an MVP. And <laughs> I think to conclude this activity, it's a great activity to do with, with your peers, <clears throat> with young people in your, in your school communities. Have fun doing it. I asked you to think about people who've inspired you. Spend some time getting young people to reflect on who in their lives, who, who's inspiring them, who's the Dorothy's in their life. You know, and get them to think about the films they've watched. You know, uh, it could be Harry Potter, it could be The Lord of the Rings or The Wizard of Oz. Think about their sports coaches. I know the coach in America is a big thing. You know, these are leaders who inspire us and ask the question, why are they inspiring us? Use the space. When you start to do MVP sessions, always be thinking about leadership. Use the space to create conversations where we bring the healthy knowledge, the healthy views and attitudes of the people you're working with to the surface. For me, we, for me, we have more in common than which divides us. And MVP is a fantastic tool to bring common views, healthy views to the surface. Do the knowledge. You know, I talked about leadership, having knowledge and understanding. You'll learn about this stuff. Don't just assume you know everything. It's what you, you know, it's what you learn after you think you know what all that counts. It was a great coach by an American baseball, basketball coach, John Wooden. Every day is a learning day, especially when it comes to abuse and violence. There's so much in the media just now around these issues in America and in the UK, around violence and abuse. You know, learn this stuff and drip it into your conversations. And look out for each other. As mentors, this is a challenging time for all of us. You're gonna be talking about some really challenging issues that might be personally um, challenging for you. Just look out for each other um, when you're doing the, the MVP program. So that's a, a short fire introduction to leadership and the bystander. And um, as I said before, thank you for involving yourself in this program. You will take a lot from the MVP program, but you know what? Society is gonna benefit a lot from your courage, determination, and your leadership. So thank you for your leadership. And folks, stay safe at this time and um, have fun. Take care.